we really are excited. We have amazing speakers. Yes. We're going to start off with someone who I call him Mr. Salt. Yes. Because if you ever go out to eat with him. Bring two salt shakers. One for him. Well, not just the salt. Else. You can't show up with one of the little Redmond vials. No. Which, by the way, salt. if you didn't know, those little tiny travel along vials, which that's how much salt you should eat in a day, they are still hand filled by hand, by a person at Redmond, which is Amazing. kind of insane. This guy, you need to bring like the big 10 ounce container because he's going to eat that much salt on yes. his steak. Yes. So he's I'm right. excited to introduce this person. If you want to know about cholesterol, if you are worried about having high cholesterol, if you are Rachel that has a 500 LDL. Can I get a hand clap for that? That is amazing. If you want to know, like, hey, is this okay? This is the guy who you want to listen to. Yeah, okay? absolutely. So his name is Dave Feldman. Yes, and I, I brought cards to read credentialing, right? Because we are not doctors, and we are not nurses, we're not? and we are not health professionals. No, we're way too crazy. They No, no. Okay. Um, but... We want to make sure that we honor all of their credentialing because we do have professionals in this space today, and we want to honor that. So Dave Feldman, who's going to be speaking up first, is a senior software engineer and entrepreneur. He began working with programming and system engineering at a very young age and has always enjoyed learning new patterns and concepts. After starting a low-carb diet, Dave found his cholesterol numbers increased considerably. I found that to be true also. He then began reverse engineering the lipid system through self-experimentation and testing, finding it was very dynamic and fluid. He has now demonstrated this multiple times by moving his cholesterol up and down substantially in a matter of days. Here to share with us the new papers, the coming study, where we go next, and why it matters. It's our honor to present Dave Feldman. How's everyone doing? Okay, so good news, bad news. The uh, bad news is this may be the least prepared I've ever had for any presentation. <laughs> Some of my fellow speakers know. The, uh, the good news is, is the reason why is because actually I had been assembling a video abstract uh, for a paper that nobody knows about yet. It actually just got released and we haven't talked about it. I'm about to talk about it now. But that video abstract will be getting premiered here for the first time. You'll be the first audience that actually sees it. Yes. Okay, so the new papers, the coming study, where we go next, and why it matters. Um, my conference of interest, of course, have a membership in Patreon revenue. It's not amazing, but it actually is very relevant because it's helping us out with the research. And of course, I'm a partner and managing director at Own Your Labs. Um, just curious, for those of you in the audience, uh, how many have never heard of me before actually coming here? Just show of hands. Ah, great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a few over there. Now, how many people didn't actually find out about myself or my work um, before the pandemic? Show of hands. Okay. Now, lastly, how many people have actually known about me since about 2017? Show of hands. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's somewhat good news because that has allowed us to propagate this research quite a bit, which I'll get into in just a moment. But before we can talk about the new papers, we have to go back to that fateful year, to 2017. Now, I'm curious, is this a familiar image to any of you? Yes. Show of hands. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, at that time, in July of 2017, just to take you back, I was writing about kind of an awkwardly named thing I called lean mass hyperresponders. The term hyperresponders predates me coming into the space, and it was in reference to those people go on a low-carb diet but see their cholesterol go up. Not a little bit, but substantially, say 50%, 100% or more. And what I found was there did seem to be a pattern that also seemed to exist for those people where they also tend to be leaner, a little bit more athletic, and also see their HDL go up and their triglycerides go down. And it was basically pattern recognition that I saw to the point that I finally decided to write this article because at around the same time I was to, starting to put together 
the basics of the lipid energy model. But I have to tell you, when I was putting this together, <laughs> I really had no idea just how accurate this actually would be. This was really the first presentation of the hypothesis itself, effectively saying, hey, here's what I think may be going on. I'd be curious what the community says. And I have to tell you, I was quite ready for a whole lot of other people coming back saying, no, this is wrong. My BMI is very high, I'm more metabolically challenged, and yet I have this profile. But rather, instead, this actually ended up being one of the most commented on posts that we've ever put in cholesterol code. I actually just looked last night, it's in 919 comments. It's because so many people kept coming in saying, no, this is me, this is actually describing me to a T. And I've been very curious to find out more about it. So this was actually a pivotal moment for us. And now, with that in mind, we can go to the new papers, flash forward to November of 2021, and we have finally published the lean mass hyperresponder paper. And there it is. By the way, you can look this up right now. If you go to cholesterolcode.com slash LMHR, you'll actually find a link to quite literally the first paper that my name is on. It's kind of cathartic by the way, to have it up there. Uh, and it kind of comes, thank you. <laughs> and it kind of comes in two uh, categories of data. The first is the web survey. The cholesterol super survey is publicly available ongoing questionnaire created by co-author DF, that's me, uh, in January 2020 with the aim of describing changes in LDL cholesterol among consumers of a carbohydrate restricted diet. The survey, advertised through social media, includes questions about height, weight, dietary intake, medications, current and past lipid test results. So really, that was the point in which I said, you know, I really need to get a survey up. My profile is growing enough to where I can hopefully get a lot more out there on social media. I'm going to circulate it through our new cholesterol code and lean mass hyperresponder Facebook groups and just try to get everybody to answer as much as possible. And that created a great basis of data. So then, I got to put together with my co-authors perhaps one of my favorite charts ever. <laughs> and this is actually what you can see is uh, three axes. And I kind of want to take a moment to explain this. These are of the participants that met our criteria being on a carb-restricted diet, which was 130 grams or less. And what you can see here on this axis, this is the x-axis, is body mass index. And as body mass index is at the highest over here, Going to the lowest, you can see the change in LDL cholesterol generally increasing. This also applies on the other axis, on the z-axis. As you go further back, prior, as in what you started with before going on the diet, prior triglyceride to HDL-C ratio, likewise, had an impact on the likely change in your LDL cholesterol. So, the lowest number we have here is 35, which is those folks who had the highest BMI and had the highest triglyceride to HDL ratio. Conversely, for those folks who had the lowest BMI and who started before going on the diet with the lowest triglyceride to HDL ratio, this 135, this isn't what their LDL cholesterol would end up being. It's the change, the net change in their LDL cholesterol. That really substantiated in a very strong way just how much this effect is very predictive. This I really like too, this is um, our figure three. And it goes a little bit more in depth because you can actually see this divide up into different distributions. So you can see in blue the lean mass hyperresponders. And you can see in red the non-lean mass hyperresponders. And we went ahead and also put in NHANES, which is from the CDC. That's just kind of a general uh, population distribution that we could pull in. And if you look in the top left um, uh, quadrant, you can see that they're almost all together, right? In fact, the mean, um, as in the, you could say, the tip of the hump on both the lean mass hyperspawners and the non-lean mass hyperspawners are nearly identical. In fact, the lean mass hyperspawners had slightly lower mean LDL cholesterol, I want to say it's around 133, 134, something like that. Whereas uh, for those that are the non-lean mass hyperspawners, it's around 135. Yet, we see, going to the upper right quadrant, you can actually see just how much this changes after they go on the diet. And note that scale. It's going from 0 to 800 LDL 
C, LDL cholesterol, you can see just how much lean mass hyperresponders show that response, how big it goes. Right below that, though, you can also see what happens with HDL cholesterol. Now, of course, HDL cholesterol being at 80 milligrams per deciliter or higher is part of the definition for lean mass hyperresponders. So, of course, they start at a higher level. But you can see just how pronounced that change still is after they've gone on the low-carb diet. We also had a case series. This is patients presenting to the clinic of co-author TK, that, by the way, is Dr. Tro, with a history of elevated LDL cholesterol following initiation of a very low-carb ketogenic diet uh, containing less than 25 grams of carbs a day. Now, they've had no personal history of myocardial infarction or stroke, were initially counseled on a, a standard of care, this, and Dr. Tro always wants me to be sure that I mention this. He always tells them standard of care. You can choose medication, and many do, in order to manage having higher levels of LDL cholesterol. But he then had some patients in this series, and these are the ones that we report on, who would instead opt to pursue an empiric clinician-supervised dietary therapy with reintroduction of 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrates a day in the form of fruits or starchy vegetables. If you remember that poster from a few slides ago, you notice how I mention glycogen stores. Glycogen stores are stored glucose. And stored glucose, especially in your liver, is very relevant to us with the lipid energy model because we believe that if you have enough hepatic glycogen stores, there's less of a need for your body to traffic around that dietary fat, or uh, sorry, the, um, um, uh, the endogenous fat, and then, of course, there's also the cholesterol that ride shares with it. So, with the reintroduction of a modest amount of carbohydrates, again, 50 to 100, right, we can actually see that change in their patients. So, over here you see pre very low carb diet. These are the different patients. This is IA, MI, RO, NM. You can see what their total and LDL were before having gone on a very low-carb diet, you can see it increases substantially, multifold. And then with the introduction of carbohydrates, taking them from a very low-carb diet to just a low-carb diet, you can see just how far down it goes. You can see this decrease over here. You can see just how far down it goes down with each patient. So to cut to the chase, here's the good news. The good news from our paper is this. If you're concerned about LDL cholesterol, and many are, and many should be respected for their concern of LDL cholesterol, then if you're coming from a more challenged state and your BMI is much higher and your triglyceride to HDL ratio isn't that great, it's highly unlikely you'll see that big of a change in your LDL cholesterol. Conversely, if you're lean, if you're fit, if you're more athletic, uh, it's probably more likely you will see this hyper response, but Again, if you and your doctor are uncomfortable with that, you can take action by moving from a very low-carb diet to a low-carb diet. That's a lot of what our paper helps to show. Now, this part I'm pretty proud of, and I, I'm happy to actually be able to talk about this on stage. Remember how I feel about open science. And you can see tweets that I say about this. Um, I both compliment David Ludwig and Kevin Hall whenever it is that they release their data and all of the analysis that goes around it. I'll even make tweets like this one, where I talk about how I, I'm optimistic that in the future this is going to be a lot more common. Well, I'm happy to say with this paper, when we published the uncorrected proof of the LMHR paper, we immediately released all the code and anonymized data in the exact same time. Our paper wasn't just for the eyes of a few reviewers in private. It was available without precondition to our biggest critics as well. Everybody could review our work and our data, find anything we overlooked and could do better and provide feedback in real time. Thank you. Now, don't get me wrong. Not every research team I'm working with may hold to this standard in the exact same way, and I don't want to tie my own hands from working with them. But I will say you can absolutely count on me to work toward the maximum transparency on these crucial questions. Look. I know I've said this many times before, both on stage and off. I just, I'm such a fan of open science, and honestly, I feel like it's where a lot of our problems have, have taken us, unfortunately. Okay, okay. So the new lean mass hyperresponder case study has just dropped. Actually, it dropped yesterday. We haven't said anything about it yet. 
But the video abstract drops right now. So let's go ahead and cue the video abstract. So we have uh, the technical folks jumping in on this one. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so actually, this is a case study. We have released it. I do want to wait until the video finishes out before I talk about it too much more. But does anyone have any questions on the prior study that we had before with the LMHRs um, that we also did uh, that got released in November? Actually, sorry, the uncorrected proof got released in November. And I believe the final version came out in uh, February, which is pretty cool. Yes, go ahead. Uh, was there anything that people submitted that you ended up correcting? Yes, yes, I'm actually glad you brought that up. So Siobhan, my uh, business partner, of course, and a good collaborator. Oh, sorry, I'll repeat her question. So she asked, was there anything that came from having released all of the data and the code that actually resulted in corrections on our part? And I'm happy to say yes, because actually the community was able to pitch in and find some things, for example, some very obscure uh, duplicates in some of the data that we couldn't easily find. Uh, and so the crowdsourced changes came back. We accepted them all. We were very appreciative of it. And for that matter, this is one of the things I often hear is folks are concerned about releasing their data because I'll hear phrases like, I don't want to do that because you're going to just try to find and poke holes in it. The whole point of releasing the data is so that you can poke holes in it, right? If there's, if there's problems with the data or the analysis, or for that matter, if somebody else can come to a better form of the analysis, that's not a bad thing. A lot of times, that's exactly what you're wanting to have happen. It, shouldn't, it's, it is a bit uh, understandable why you'd want to feel like you'd have control of the data that you worked hard to assemble and get together. But the bottom line is, we really all want to have the same goals, right? We all want to accomplish getting to what the real answers are. And for that matter, if there's you know, something that could be found in our data, and I hope you know, many people feel uh, the interest in being able to you know, analyze it, put it together, and work with it in different ways, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Any other questions? Yes? Yes, um, it's in... Um, CDN, Current Developments in Nutrition, is what it's in right now. If you go to cholesterolcode.com slash LMHR, it's right there at the top. We have a link right there at the top. And that's actually been our kind of standing informative page up until this point. Um, anyone else? No? You know, actually, I tell you what. I, I have a slide that's toward the end. Um, on somebody who I wanted to take a little time to talk about if I had some time. How many of you guys know Sarah Hallberg? Clap if she had an effect on your life. Um, I, have a, I have a personal story to share. I hope I can say it even keel, it doesn't mess with me for the rest of the speech. But, it, but I have to tell you, she, you may not know this, she directly helped me at the earliest possible stages of my research. In uh, Low Carb Vale, I want to say 2016, February of 2016, I had my first eight blood tests, which I'm sure Siobhan would laugh at because we now know I have something around 140 between all of the different experiments I've done. And um, I had those first eight, and I had them in a graph, and I was showcasing how consuming more fat would unintuitively bring down LDL cholesterol and vice versa. Uh, and I was taking it around to all the different people, all the speakers at Low Carb Vale, and nobody knew who I was, and everyone thought I was this crazy engineer. Oh, actually, that's still true. <laughs> but that uh, I, th I just, I was speaking a lot of gibberish because I kept talking about these APOBs and I kept talking about, um, you know, this energy system and how that might be you know, relevant. And I wanted to find the people. I, I realized pretty quickly, because I had first gone to this mixer that's usually just before the conference, and I realized I was speaking Greek to everybody. Uh, so I wanted to find somebody who seemed to know a lot about cholesterol in particular. And it was actually Jason Fung who said, you need to just talk to a lipidologist. Uh, you should talk to Sarah. And I was like, Sarah, too. He's like, well, Sarah Hallberg, she's amazing. But she wasn't there at the mixer. And then I looked for her the next morning, Friday, the, the first of the uh, two days of the conference. She wasn't there either. 
and yet she was on the schedule. Well, it turned out that she was just arriving just to do her talk during her talk, talk slot, and then I had heard that she was going to immediately leave with her family to then go skiing. Because, frankly, low-carb veil was, and they'll admit this now, was kind of like an excuse, a way for them to get a lot of skiing in while also sharing a lot of interesting information on low-carb, right? Well, um, she did her talk. She was walking down the aisle. This is a true story. And I literally stood up and in the middle of the aisle and kind of blocked her exit from getting back out. <laughs> had my laptop ready, and I turned my laptop, and I was like, Sarah, I'd love to be able to talk to you about this. Is there any way, if not now, that we could talk at some later point? And she's like, yeah, um, what is it you have? And, and we went off to the back, and I was showing it to her, and her family, literally, her husband's, like, just outside the door, and he's kind of, like, waiting, clearly, and I'm being a real nuisance. And even though she was clearly on her way out, she took the time to listen to what I said more than anybody else. We ultimately scheduled a Zoom, and then following that Zoom, which was, I want to say, maybe a month later, because she was very busy then as well, we had a great conversation. And I can, I can proudly say to this day, she has taken several different steps that helped me early on in the research, particularly in connecting with a number of lipidologists. Now, not a lot came of the lipidologists that she knew that she connected me with. However, it was a crucial... Um, point in time that I needed to get to to understand what it would take for me to ultimately then turn around to do uh, the studies that I'll be telling you about next. Oh, it looks as if the video is set up, but I, but I do want to finish off with this real quick. Sarah Hallberg is, was, she was truly one of the good guys. If you've ever had the pleasure of getting to know her personally, I can tell you she's exactly the person she looks like on screen. She's a strong advocate for her patients and for all of us, for low carb and how it's helped so many others. So if I could ask one big round of applause for <laughs> everything she's done. She's just an incredible human being and, and a tremendous loss. So back to the video. Here we go. In a recent paper, we discussed how some individuals see increased cholesterol levels after going on a low carb diet. In fact, this seems closely related to how lean these individuals are alongside common markers for good metabolic health. This brings up some very big questions. Just how high can cholesterol levels go in this situation? Is it likely the leanest of these folks are just consuming the most saturated fat? And perhaps most importantly, would we find development of heart disease in the most extreme cases? Well, I'm happy to say we've just released a new comprehensive case study that may give us some interesting data on all these questions and more. Before we get started, I need to give a couple of important disclaimers. One, this video does not constitute medical advice. And two, we remind viewers that existing guidelines and major institutions focused on heart disease strongly advise against high cholesterol levels. Our case study centers around a 26-year-old male who adopted a ketogenic diet to manage severe ulcerative colitis. This diet strategy has worked remarkably well for his treatment, but it also resulted in a substantial increase in his LDL cholesterol, a well-regarded risk factor for heart disease. However, he likewise saw his HDL cholesterol rise and triglycerides fall, and these are two markers associated with a low risk of heart disease. We discussed this triad of high LDL, high HDL, and low triglycerides in our prior paper around this profile we refer to as lean mass hyperresponders. And yes, our patient certainly fits this profile as well. Don't worry if you're new to this, we'll post a link to that paper down below. This brings us to the first key question. Just how high can these cholesterol levels go in this situation? In the case of our patient, his LDL levels increased from 95 before the keto diet to as high as 545 milligrams per deciliter at its peak. These levels are rarely seen save some extreme examples of the genetic disease familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH. And unfortunately, for those born with FH at these levels, there is typically a very rapid development of plaque in the arteries, leading to the onset of clinical heart disease in very early childhood. Notably, the patient also had advanced genetic testing, such as whole exome sequencing and heart disease risk assessment, but no genetic mutations were found that could explain these levels. For some further background, in our prior paper, we showed an inverse association between BMI and LDL cholesterol in the context of a low-carb diet. 
This means it predicted leaner people who would appear to be more likely to develop high LDL on a low carb diet. We also showed that adding back some carbohydrates could reverse the high LDL. This falls in line with our patient. In an effort to reduce his LDL, he tried on multiple occasions to increase carbohydrate intake and come off his ketogenic diet. But every time he did so, he had a relapse of his inflammatory bowel disease. However, as the inflammatory bowel disease remained in remission and he was able to gain weight, thus increasing his BMI, his LDL cholesterol decreased. Okay, but is it possible this is all just high consumption of saturated fat? Many speculate that these increased levels of LDL cholesterol with low carb can simply be attributed to greater consumption of saturated fat. Yet as I've just alluded to, this is another area our patient can provide some additional insight. His low carb diet is more Mediterranean style, with emphasis on fatty seafood, extra virgin olive oil, and low carb fruits and vegetables. And thus his consumption of unsaturated fat typically exceeded 82% of total fat intake, with saturated fat being less than 18%. However, in his final test of October 2021, he changed his diet to one with a much higher proportion of saturated fat at 45%. Yet this threefold increase in relative saturated fat intake had little impact on resulting LDL cholesterol in the context of his moderate increase in BMI. Simply put, in this patient, BMI dominated over saturated fat and dietary cholesterol consumption in determining LDL levels. Lastly, will these extreme levels of LDL cholesterol demonstrate rapid progression of arterial plaque? Throughout the study period, the patient and his care team were especially interested in assessing his risk. Given available data on FH patients with cholesterol levels this high, there was understandably a concern that at least some detectable plaque would have developed since he began the diet almost three years ago. The patient scheduled a CT angiogram, which provides an advanced high-resolution scan for the heart and its surrounding arteries. CCTAs can easily pick up plaque volume even at very small sizes. In the case of our patient, the scan demonstrated no coronary artery disease. All cross-sectional views showed no plaque volume of any kind, and this was confirmed by the independent analysis of three different cardiac imaging specialists. But is this surprising or to be expected after only 2.5 years of extremely high LDL? Unfortunately, a limitation of our current science is there are very little CCTA data available for comparison to our patient. However, our case report does cite a published case series including a baby diagnosed with homozygous FH and an LDL of 548 who started multiple medications at around age two to lower these levels. With further treatment, his doctors were able to get his LDL to 139, but in spite of these interventions, the patient's first CT angiogram at age eight identified plaque buildup in multiple arteries. This comparison is interesting because again, both this homozygous FH patient and our patient had a similar two-year exposure to LDL levels around 500, and our patient had the additional exposure to normal LDL for over two decades of life. And yet, it was the older lean mass hyperresponder patient who exhibited the complete absence of detectable plaque. While these data on our patient are comprehensive and provide potential new insights, they are limited in scope and time span. It's certainly possible this patient is an outlier or that their progression of plaque will take place later or many other such possibilities. Even if this risk profile in the short term turns out to be in striking contrast to those with FH, it only further underscores the need for more research on this phenomenon overall. Fortunately, there is also an upcoming prospective study for 100 lean mass hyperresponders that will likewise employ CT angiography. There's a lot more in this case study than we cover here, so be sure to read it from the link in the description down below. And as always, thank you for watching. So I'm curious if when we release papers, we had a likewise video such as this, do you think you would like the, the paper, the researchers a little bit more? <laughs> this is something uh, Nick Norwitz and I have actually discussed quite a bit, and we're going to see if we can actually do this a bit more often. Uh, we think that the extra work will help to further communicate beyond just putting it into a journal, actually being able to get it to translate to everybody else as well. Okay, so again, the highlights for this case study. 
LDLC increased from 95 to 545 milligrams per deciliter on a keto diet with this patient with an over four to one unsaturated to saturated fat ratio. I hope you've all have caught that. This patient actually consumes a more Mediterranean style diet. The increased BMI correlated with decreased LDL cholesterol, even with a higher saturated fat. So that one phase where he had a threefold increase in saturated fat, that didn't change his LDL. It tracked much closer to his BMI. And no genetic abnormalities found to explain this phenotype. Again, his LDL was below 100, even before this had started. But the CT, angio, uh, the CT angiogram at 2.5 years showed no plaque. Now, as I said in the video, and as I'll say again, this should still be treated with caution. We should still say that while this is an incredible finding, this, it could be that this is an outlier, and it could be that there could be plaque that would show up later. But that said, this has been pretty fascinating because this was a very high-resolution uh, CT angiogram. Okay, so the coming study. By now, hopefully nobody is left in this room who hasn't heard about this. We've got two organizations, two sets of responsibilities for the lean mass hyperresponder study out of Lundquist. We're handling the funding, recruitment, and travel arrangements under the Citizen Science Foundation. And thank you once again for everybody who's been able to contribute. And of course, the Lundquist Institute has been able to handle the participant examination, the blood work, and the CT scanning. And this is why you're seeing me still putting out a lot of tweets and graphics like this one. I want you for the study. So if you're watching this right now and you haven't yet seen this page, please go to citizensciencefoundation.org slash study if indeed you meet these tweets, right? This is like, like I said, I'm putting this out on all kinds of social media anywhere I can because we haven't fully hit our recruitment goals yet. So if you've had an LDL cholesterol go from 160 and below, right? to 190 and above, and whatever the difference is between those two, it's at least a 50% increase. That qualifies so long as you also have an HDL of 60 or higher and triglycerides of 80 or lower. You, of course, do need to be US-based, and we do have some other criteria, but those are the majors. So if you or somebody you know meet that, then look at the second tweet. You get free low-dose CT angiography, you get free genetic testing, and of course, you get free wide-spectrum blood work to assess risk. So this is the crucial data we're collecting and why it matters. We're tracking plaque. It's assumed the vast majority of people have some degree of overall plaque progression, atherosclerosis, over time. Capturing plaques by CT angiograms at one point in time, and again at a later point in time, gives us enormous insight into the overall progression levels of atherosclerosis. To be sure, high-resolution CTA longitudinal data has mainly been collected on high-risk populations, not on low-risk population. But this gives us plenty to work with. We'll have powerful data when combined with single-scan studies of both high- and low-risk populations for comparison. Again, remember the example of familial hypercholesterolemia and how rapidly we see increased plaque levels for that context. So, Consider this, less than 3% of the U.S. population, less than 3% has an LDL cholesterol of 190 milligrams per deciliter or higher. Given that lean mass hyperresponders have LDL cholesterol in the top 3% of the U.S. population, it would commonly be expected they would likewise have high progression of atherosclerosis since it's at the highest third of the general population. Or, conversely, where lean mass hyperresponders have LDL cholesterol in the top 3%, it would run counter to conventional expectation to observe a low progression of atherosclerosis, such as in the lowest third of the population. This is why I keep bringing it back to the question of magnitude. Plainly stated, a high magnitude of plaque progression is easy to detect with CT image comparison in a very short span of time. Many existing studies have demonstrated this. And while we will certainly be looking at many more aspects of these plaques, their overall progression, especially at the aggregate level, at a population level, will provide powerful evidence regarding magnitude of expected risk. Now, interestingly, as we get closer to the study, 
There have been many who predicted that lean mass hyperresponders will demonstrate a low progression of atherosclerosis, but speculate their progression would be even lower were every risk factor the same, save low LDL cholesterol rather than high. In other words, and listen carefully, lean mass hyperresponders would be low risk, but suboptimal when compared to the lowest possible risk. Given our study doesn't have a control, it is unlikely to provide much in the way of answering this speculation, if the plaque progressions were low enough to suggest this. So consider this. If we go back to the early 1970s with Drs. Brown and Goldstein, they saw a pivotal patient that, in their words, actually determined the scientific course of the rest of our lives. The patient was a little girl with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, and she had a total cholesterol of around 850 with an LDL of 783. And it's heartbreaking, but she had angina and xanthomas at age three. And she had a heart attack, her first heart attack at age six. These are many of the children who are born with FH. It's compelling. It's compelling to see, with, this is what's, see when this is happening and to know that this is the odds of getting FH is uh, one in a million. In the words of Dr. Goldstein, this little girl had only an elevated LDL. She had no high blood pressure. She had no diabetes. She didn't smoke. She didn't have a type A personality. Her only risk factor for having a heart attack at age six was this high level of LDL. So it's one of the best examples of a disease where we really know the cause. The cause of the disease in this little girl is an increased level of her LDL. Now, the reason I'm really, really pressing on both of these comparisons, lean mass hyperresponders, homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, is because they're actually the closest, right? But it's all the more reason why we need to get to at least the easiest question to answer, which is the one of magnitude. Is it a big magnitude of effect, which is easy to detect, and easy to confirm, or is it a small magnitude effect, which is hard to detect and hard to confirm? Because, plainly stated, if lean mass hyperresponders at the same levels as children with homozygous FH are not seeing a progression of plaque anywhere near as comparable, then you'd have to ask, what is the difference? Maybe there is a difference beyond just LDL. And I don't say that lightly because I don't know the answer to that question. It's why we need to just go get the data. This is, of course, where I was going to be talking about Sarah, but I'm, I'm almost out of time. I, just, I do just want to say just one more time that she, she was a very remarkable human being. And I, we were just so blessed that, that she found low carb. That's all I'm going to say. Just, I just, I'm so thankful for her. And on that note, special thanks to all the members and patrons of Cholesterol Code, all contributors of the Citizen Science Foundation, all my amazing co-authors for these and coming papers, Siobhan Huggins, who, by the way, I'm so happy was able to join us here today for her tireless work in helping us get here, and to my very good friend and collaborator, Nick Norwitz. And, and if I could just fit in with just a couple more minutes, if you're not following Nick right now on social media, you need to correct that mistake. He is fantastic, and he has really, really turbocharged this work to take us to the next level. We have so many great things coming ahead, including the lipid energy model paper, which I'm happy to say is nearing, knock on wood, it's nearing its, its later stages. Hopefully we're going to be uh, uh, getting into publication here pretty soon. And that's my talk. Once again, please look out for the citizensciencefoundation.org slash study and help us meet our recruitment goals. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll take that from you. We are so personally thankful for Dave and Siobhan and everybody over at Own Your Labs because pre-keto, we didn't own managed. our labs. We nope. feared our labs. And I'm so excited for the research that he and his team are doing and so many in this space because our children and our grandchildren are going to have a very different experience at the doctor. Are you excited about that? Because I really, really am. And I do want to encourage you. I know they're not a sponsor, but Dave is awesome. Yes. Um, if you do want to get your labs done, maybe you don't want to go through your doctor, go to ownyourlabs.com. Yes. Because you can order a lot of blood tests. And honestly, we actually put together a package with them for the lab test that we did, that Dr. Barry recommended for us when we did beef, butter, bacon, and egg last year. That was a delicious and challenge. 
the thing about it, all of our labs combined, I think it was like $130. That was less than if we would have paid the copay to our insurance company to get those labs done. Yeah. So it's a great way that you can help them with their studies and get information for yourself. 